another episode of the Being and Doing podcast, uh, where I try to create a space dedicated to the unique minds that are all around us and share the sto their stories that will hopefully challenge, inspire, and stimulate their being. And today with me uh, is a very, very special lady, Lizette Oropesa. And uh, I was finding it very difficult to describe her because uh, she just is uh, and is a lot of things. Uh, I feel like she's a poet scientist and a poet because she kind of encompasses a huge range of emotions. And then a scientist because of the meticulousness which she puts in analyzing, preparing, and just, I think, living her life. I don't know if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, doing her justice, but I, this, is, this is my impression. Um, so I'm just very curious to, to get to know you better and uh, for my audience to get to know you better. So welcome, Lizette. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I I feel very honored to be here to talk to you today. And I'm really grateful um, that you feel that way, that you get that impression from whatever it is that we put out there as artists, as singers, that really it's nice to be able to touch people on a human level and a scientific level at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, start this podcast uh, by asking, uh, what are some words um, you can choose that you use to describe yourself with? Well... Um, it depends on who I'm talking to. Uh, you know, um, I think we are all very self-critical as artists a lot of the time. And I always try to, when I'm teaching young singers, I always try to let them know that the, the worst critic is always you. Yeah. Um, but I absolutely am my worst critic and I'm, I'm very self-critical. Um, but I don't want to start off on a negative note, even though I just have, but honestly, um, I also feel like I have a, I'm a Libra. Mm -hmm. That's my astrological sign. And I, I, I often feel the pull of opposing forces. So while on one hand, I'm very, very self-critical on another hand, I'm very grateful when things go well. Like I really am grateful. I'm happy. I feel a sense of major relief when, when things go well, when, when people send me messages or say nice things or compliment my work, it makes the self-critical part better. Uh, so I would say, I guess I'm always seeking to balance that, that feeling of feeling like it's never enough. It's never perfect. It's, I want, I wish I could do that. I I'm limited, uh, but I'm also grateful. So I would say self-critical grateful. Um, I'm very aware of what I've been given that was of no, that was just a blessing, like a pure blessing. And then I'm aware of the things that I've worked for. And I know that there's a difference. I feel like there are many things that you can get as a gift in a way that are privileges, if you will. Like, uh, I feel like I had an advantage being born into a Hispanic family, made me bilingual as a gift, as a gift. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have to go out and learn Spanish, um, but it also makes my language study easier. I'm aware that that's an advantage. Uh, I'm aware that um, being um, a person who is diligent about um, about health is an advantage. I, I, but I know that that's something that I work for. Mm. That's not something that was just a gift. So, um, I guess you can say self-aware is, is one word that I like to describe myself with. Um, you know, we could go on and on. I, I feel like those are probably the main ones mm. at the moment. So, so uh, before the interview, I was actually thinking of you as ever evolving, um, ah. but, um, but uh, mm. that there is something about what you're describing is evolving with compassion. And there is something about you that I feel that uh, is harnessing that compassion towards yourself. So I'm curious, where do you find that? And how did you, did you work for that? Or is that something that came as a gift as well? You know, um, I, I feel like it's mainly that's a gift because I was brought up in a very, um, I don't want to say a poor family, but I do have to say a poor family. It, I don't want it to come across like I'm trying to say, yeah. oh, feel sorry for me or my background, because we were lucky that my family could come to the United States when they came before I was born, which is another privilege. I was born in the United States and not in Cuba, where my mother and father are from. And um, 
I, I'm very aware that they made a big sacrifice to come to the United States for us, but they were always letting us know that whatever we had, we had to work for and that nothing was going to come easily without sacrifice. So it, and we had to share everything. You know, when you grow up in a poor family, mm. it's not like you have many, many, many sets of toys and many, many, many new things to play with. You have, you're getting hand-me-downs, you're getting things that maybe you got at um, chair in charitable organizations, the kinds of new clothes. I rarely got new clothes. I mean, so I, now that I, I've grown up, I've worked very hard, I've done very well for myself. Um, I I'm able to look back and notice when I see people that are underprivileged as far as money is concerned and notice and know what that's like, how, how hard that must be. And so I feel like that helped me, it helped me build compassion, I suppose, uh, for people. Now that's, ha that's having to do with people in the sense of people who are struggling financially. But the thing is, so many singers do struggle financially, Alexandra, as I'm sure you know, um, and start out behind, several steps behind financially and then they can never get the opportunity to sing or make music because they're behind financially and that is really hard for me to accept it's hard for me to see it's hard for me to deal with like i won many competitions when i was younger but i also had patrons who helped me patrons who bought me clothes patrons who took me to nice dinners patrons who introduced me to wealthy other wealthy people who appreciated me and hired me to come sing for their wedding or sing for this or sing for that. do you know what i'm saying so it was like i always i was i had help I had help. So I, if that helps me build compassion towards young singers or young artists or, or it, artists in general who are trying to make it, who don't have those things, then yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's definitely there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious actually, uh, how much of the, um, uh, let's say the Cuban spirit and the <laughs> way of being, uh, you are you embodying because uh, the interesting thing while i'm observing you i come from yugoslavia which was a communist country and there mm. is something in that sharing yeah. although there are many downsides which we don't need to talk about but there is something about uh, that normalizing equalizing people that really builds uh, a different way of living and seeing the world and i'm wondering mm. if that's the case for you were you touched by that or it's just something that I'm experiencing and I'm projecting. <laughs> you know, Alexandra, it's interesting that you say that because I didn't grow up in communist Cuba. My family fled communist yes. Cuba, which means that even though we had to start out with very little in a capitalist country and we had a very hard time moving up in a capitalist country, they never let us forget how bad things were in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So we had to, even though we didn't live in communist Cuba, we were in America, we were in the land of the rich and land of the wealthy and things everywhere. And everybody has such nice clothes and toys. You know, you need to appreciate these crayons because there are children in Cuba who have one crayon in the whole classroom to play with and you have a box. So it was like everything that we, we even though I never went to, I went to Cuba, it was like, I knew all about it because that's what taught me to appreciate the things that I did have, even though I would come home and I, now I'm so ashamed of myself as an adult. But when I was a child, I didn't know that. I would go to school and I would see kids with new shoes or a nice backpack or cool, you know, gadgets, mm -hmm. the best, the best calculator, you know, nice watches, whatever, all these things. And I would come home crying because I didn't have new clothes. I didn't have new shoes. I didn't have a cool calculator. I didn't have all those things. And my mother and my family would be mad at me and would say, how, you know, mm -hmm. you don't understand what it's like to have nothing to have less than nothing to have any clothes on your back at all so it was like i at the time i was angry because i was little and i didn't get it i didn't get it they got it and they tried to teach me to get it now i get it looking back yeah. more than, than i did then you know mm -hmm. i mean that anger is understandable because uh, it's a pain that the ch child has i that that mm -hmm. part i understand but i do also mm -hmm. understand the, that they're trying to give us the wider picture of how life can be <laughs> yeah yeah. Yes. And uh, I was also curious then um, the Hispanic uh, background. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, there is something about something romantic about that, <laughs> <laughs> that background and just some sort of freedom, which I personally love. Um, I'm wondering, do you, 
does is that something that you embody and if, is that something that you bring with you on the stage and in general in your interactions yes i think cuban people and maybe other people who grow up in societies like this um cuban people live in a beautiful paradise and they love music and they make do with very little yeah. but they're happy people yeah. they're not a sad people they're not even though they're oppressed on paper we think wow that's an oppressed society they don't behave like an oppressed society they're making music they're singing they're dancing they're having fun they're on the beach they're you know even though they might have no shampoo <laughs> you know or no you know uh, not a lot of food um they find a way to make the best out of a situation and i think as a Cuban person growing up in a Cuban household, you know, where there's always music playing, there was always family coming over. We were always having a good time together and we learned to make fun, happy times out of very little, out of just each other, our company, you know, and appreciating what we, the little that we did have. And then I realized, wow, you don't need, they say money doesn't buy happiness. And it's true. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. I mean, of course, it's nice to have security. It's nice to have things that you need. Um, but real happiness, honest happiness, and it's something that I think everybody searches for and tries to understand and tries to like grab it and hang on to it forever. What is it? Um, and is it tied to money or is it tied to love or is it tied to family or is it what is it really about? You know, um, and it can probably be tied to any of those things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so many people say, if I only had this one thing, I'd be happy. I'd be fulfilled. I'd had everything I need. And some, for some people that's love for some people, that's security for some people, that's safety for some people. That's, you know, beauty youth. I mean, so I always feel for me, I am truly happy, Alexandra, no matter how self-critical I am being, having that household, having that love in my family and that support in my family. And they loved music and they loved that. I was singing that really taught me how to be happy. And I really am like, there's nothing missing in my life. Zero. I'm mm -hmm. super, super happy. Yeah. No, that's, that's very interesting. You're saying, because I often am feel because I grew up in a family where we would just sing after lunch and everything would be very um music was just generally very present and I have an embodied experience. So I know oh. I often feel uh, privileged I, I felt that was a privilege. <laughs> it is. It yeah. is. So yeah. many people don't have that support. So many singers don't have, they have the family trying to get them to stop singing. Yes. Yeah. And I had the opposite. So that's a huge a blessing, a gift, advantage. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious uh, because we talked about ever evolving and you are, again, I have a feeling ever evolving from a very healthy place. So from a place of... <laughs> I want to learn, I'm curious, I want to expand. So uh, I'm wondering, how did you build that relationship with yourself? Um, and you talk a lot about health and fitness and running. Um, yeah. So how did you get in touch with that place where I do want to grow, but from, a, from an attuned place? Yeah, I think that the need for change all the time is something that... Um, and not even just change, but improvement, mm -hmm. kind of desperately seeking improvement. Uh, I feel like it, it, as an artist, it's kind of being an artist that made that happen because you're, you can't ever really settle in a technique or in anything, especially as a singer, because I mean, your voice doesn't get put away in a box and go under the bed. Your voice is in your body. So you're ever evolving, whether you like it or not. And so your voice is going to react to everything. So if you are settled in your life, like you're happy, you have a good relationship and you have a, a career that you're satisfied with, or maybe you live in a great place, all those things are lovely, but then you, vocally every day is something new. So um, you have to be able to shift, <laughs> you know, and in my personal life, I've always felt like uh, there were just things that I needed to change that mm -hmm. I work on changing every day. You know, and one of them was, uh, was my, my body. I, I, I was very unhealthy for many, many years. I grew up eating junk food, uh, you know, essentially a lot of that was because we were just poor. A lot of that was because I grew up in the South and I mean, 
the culture there is a very different type of lifestyle, what you eat and how you, the activities that you do. I was never involved in sports. I was always in music or studying. So I didn't, you know, go outside and play sports with my friends. It was not that life at all. But the problem was that I gained a lot of weight and I grew up getting heavier and heavier. And then even though I was, a, uh, you know, I was a very lucky singer and that I got many opportunities because I could sing well, they would always the judges or the directors always let me know, by the way, though, you're too fat. And I got that all the time, Alexandra, in high school, even I got it in college. I got it after college. It started to really get to something that they were basically telling me, fix this or else, because you're, you, you, and that was something I had to put together and, and find a new way to, to live my life. And, and, you know, and I think, I don't know if you've ever been overweight, Alexandra, if you've ever been a fat person. I haven't. Um, especially if you're one when you're younger. Mm -hmm. Those scars of being made fun of, being bullied, being told you were fat and ugly, they're forever. Mm -hmm. They never go away. No matter how thin you get, no matter how beautiful, quote unquote, people say, that you are, no matter how healthy even that you become, you appreciate your health that much more because you know that in three cheeseburgers, you could go the other way really quickly, you know, um, because you've been there. So it's kind of, again, I appreciate it. I know it's something I had to work very hard for. I have to continue to work very hard for, um, but it's made me happier. It's made me sing better. It's made me um, feel more confident in everything that I do. And uh, and it inspires other people because people write to me and they say, oh, listen, I, I'm, I want to run because of you. I, I want to, you know, get active. I want to change my life. I want to lose weight. They're telling me I need to lose weight. And I always try to tell them, give them the best advice I can, which is only, you know, how to do it and when to do it. Don't do it because someone told you do it when you're ready. And I never tell young singers that they need to lose weight ever. I wish that that was never even a conversation that singers ever had to have ever. Uh, but it's still very much part of the industry. It's very much part of, uh, what the public sees from us. And they talk to us. The public tells me all the time. They used to tell me all the time when I was overweight, they told me when I lost weight, you know, it's not like, even if the intendants don't talk about it, even if the directors don't talk about it, even if managers and agents don't talk about it, the public does. And the public will whether you like it or not, a patron will come up to you and tell you you're too fat to wear that dress, period. And it's the kind of thing singers deal with. We can't escape it. So yeah, so there is, there, is, there, there is a very important, I think, question for me there, because I remember when I was dancing and, and there is something about being an artist and being chosen by someone and that we are somewhat not in control of of who is going to choose us. Mm. Uh, and I remember I was even told, um, you are not pretty enough and we can teach an ugly girl to dance, but we cannot make an, um, uh, no, sorry, we can uh, teach a pretty girl to dance, but we cannot make an ugly girl pretty. And- Oh my God. Yeah. And you are so beautiful. I can't, I, I, it I hope you know that. Yeah, now I do, but at okay. the time it was not it was not easy. <laughs> oh my god. So I'm I'm just thinking about you being told you're you are too fat or looking whatever in your in your dress. Mm. I'm just wondering uh and and I do understand the scars. Mm. Sometimes it's I actually normally am told I'm too skinny, so it's like the opposite. You're always too something, whatever that is. But I'm just yeah. wondering about that place for an artist and about accepting the place where we are. Because in the type of therapy I do, there is something that people call paradoxical theory of change. And it states that we cannot be something else until, until we accept who we are here and now. Ah. And this is a very paradoxical, obviously, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, how did this change happen for you again still following you for some time knowing that it feels like it has come from a healthy place mm -hmm. uh, and how how did how did you find that place of self-acceptance regardless of the scars that I do understand have stayed with you well I mean I certainly knew that I was overweight 
I never th thought that I was not. That's the thing. I think all overweight people know that. And I think people don't realize that they know that. That's why they're always telling them. And it, yeah. it's insulting to tell a fat person, you know, you're fat, right? Like they don't know. <laughs> like you're the newscaster of the day giving them news. By the way, you're fat. Like that's, that's why I don't, I never tell them. I never say this to them. I don't, they don't need me to tell them. They know. So of course I knew. Now, the problem is, Alexandra, that it hurts your confidence because if you are fat, but you go to sing an audition, you're not going to sing the audition from a place of apologizing and being ashamed of yourself and be like, I'm sorry, I, don't, I know you guys don't like the way I look, but I'm going to sing for you anyway. You would never do that. In fact, you would always do the opposite, which is I'm here, I'm present, I'm giving the best of my emotions, my facial expressions. I'm comfortable in my body, even though my body is large. But then you get so much feedback that it could hurt your confidence. And then that hurts your ability to then sing sometimes because it hurts. So did I know that I was overweight before I started to take on the challenge of changing? Yes, 100%. That's why I always tell people when I do, when they do ask me for personal advice, I say, don't do it because someone else told you. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you every day you, when you are ready to say, I want to make a change, I'm going to do it. Then you, then you go forward and you talk to your doctor and you talk to your nutritionist or whatever steps you want to take, you know, but to, to say, I'm, I, you know, I'm being pressured and I'm being this and I'm being that. And it's like, do you feel like you need to change? Yeah. For some people lose simply losing weight is not the answer. It's not going to solve their problem as a singer if they're having a problem as a singer, because some people think, and I thought this too, I thought, well, if I just lose weight, maybe, you know, I will have every job that I, that I want. And that's not the case, simply. There are other things that have to be addressed. And also, as I'm sure you know, in your work, I mean, people, what they eat, and who they are as a human being is very much tied up with their emotional state. So if you just go to start going to the gym and start going, you know, start dieting and you're losing weight, you're going to, at some point, maybe confront some psychological block that at some point you have to confront that dieting is not going to fix. Dieting might make you thinner. It might make you look great in your clothes. It might make you feel good, you know, all that, but whatever that psychological block that you have that does need to be addressed. So, I mean, why are you eating? Why are you making your emotions, feeding your emotions this way? Why do you, you know, why do you feel down about yourself? Is it really because you're overweight or is there something else? So I, you know, for me, being overweight was a big problem, but it was that I always felt like I wondered if there was something more I needed to do. Like, mm -hmm. what do you, what, more do I need to, to do that I'm not doing? Mm -hmm. Because even when I started to lose weight, my path didn't just suddenly open and every single door was open to me. No, there were still a few blocks. And I remember just being desperate and being like, what am I doing wrong? I've lost weight. I've worked on my body. I've worked on my look. I have my social media. I have this, this, what's the problem? Is my voice, is it my voice? If it's that, please tell me so I can fix it. You know. So I was always looking for the what the why. And, and eventually, um, I had to make some professional decisions that were difficult, um, but were the right ones. And I had to have a few hard talks with myself about realizing vocally what I, what I really was and who I really was, and then accepting that <laughs> and going from there, you know, um, I wasn't the coloratura I wanted to be. I wanted to sing much higher. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to sing in the middle and I wasn't a full lyric. I was in the middle somewhere, which is kind of hard. It's like having wavy hair. Like you're not all the way curly, you're not all the way straight. You're kind of in the middle somewhere. And usually you have to make some adjustment to fit into one group or the other. Um, and there were people who, you know, didn't like my voice, don't like my voice to this day. There are people who, who, you know, um, don't agree with my technique. Maybe there are people, all kinds of that. I mean, we get all that feedback, yeah. but what do I think personally, you know what? I'm doing the best I can do with the instrument that I've been given, period. And now I accept it more than I did.
Yeah. Sorry, it's a really long answer. I'm so sorry. No, I actually really love it. And I think (laughs) it's it's really useful because I think uh, one of the reasons I do this interviews is talking about success. And the reason Mm -hmm. I want to talk about it is because we normally feel always see the finished product. And uh, and I think behind that there is a story which we often when we come to the finished product romanticize but I feel like you're very authentic in expressing the story (laughs) the journey (laughs) so that's that's too much (laughs) no I would I mean not for me at least (laughs) I appreciate that thank you Uh, uh, so uh, there's uh, one thing when you uh, when I listen to your interviews and in general because I am thinking about the voice a lot because it's a very meaningful thing to, for me and that is that when we are using the voice we are the instrument. Yes. And you talked about separating the criticism uh, about the voice from actually the core of who we are and from the mm-hmm. our being although that's very difficult. Mm-hmm. So. I'm very curious to hear how was that process of realizing and honing yourself, like your whole self as an instrument <laughs> being, and what were maybe some challenges or what did, what supported you actually in this, in this journey? Well, um, you're absolutely right that, you know, the whole self is what it expresses. It's really even more than just the voice, because I mean, you can get up there and sing on a record and people are listening, but when you're on stage, it's theater and people are also watching and they're experiencing everything. The voice is around them, but they're also looking at you and you're a three-dimensional image. You're not uh, a camera, you know, a camera angle, two-dimensional kind of thing. So um, one of the greatest, most liberating things actually I learned in yoga <laughs> about singing and that is to, uh, and I also had a, a, a yoga um, teacher who is kind of, um, a guru, um, very important man in my life named Nathaniel Murray. And he was a, our fitness instructor of when we were young artists at the Met. And Nathaniel is one of those amazing, like his, he's like so enlightened, like nothing bothers him, just brilliant, all health through and through shines, radiates being. And when I'm around him, I'm just so happy. Um, and he's such a loving and encompassing person. He is yoga. He is yoga come to life, Mm -hmm. you know? And one of the things he used to always say was go as far as you can go today, Mm. go as far as you can go today. And then in yoga class, you often hear something like, you know, find your intelligent edge Mm -hmm. and don't go past that. Or, you know, um, you know, go, go with where you are, accept where you are in this pose and this journey today and, you know, make adjustments and all that, that whole idea of it being okay to not be level 10, it being part of the journey that you're at level two, level three, and that you have to adjust sometimes. And that's fine. In fact, that's preferable than you pushing yourself and doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And yoga taught me that it, it's like, it teaches you to accept the humble limits of your body at the time that you have them. And that's something that vocally I have had to do that everyone has to do. I mean, I I would love to be able to be able to sing anything I want, whenever I want as high and low as I want forever (laughs) and have a fresh voice of a 30 year old forever. Yeah, no, not going to happen. And that's this ridiculous thing to try to accomplish and to try to go after because it's, it's not healthy. You'll never, you'll be disappointed constantly and you'll never love and accept your craft for what it is and saying, you know what, I'm a human being. I have these limits, but I also have these flaws that when another being observes them, they go, Oh, look, that's me. I have those flaws too. Or look, this vulnerability. I relate to that. Or look, that confidence, that strength, that fearlessness, you know, of, I don't care how ugly I look in this moment. I'm going to give you this emotion in its raw ugliness or whatever it is. And that is very powerful. Um, as a performer, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like um, when I'm on stage, nobody can stop me. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody could say, stop the show. Her hair is out of place. You know, I mean, that's not going to happen. And, and, and as a, I think when you're an audience member and you're observing other singers who sing that way and perform that way, you just, you go to, you're overwhelmed by the fearlessness of yes. them opening up that way. 
Uh, and I, I've seen so many singers that are like that, you know, and then I've seen singers who aren't singers who have a wall singers who are always trying to look beautiful singers who are never um, really going all the way to it. And that's where they are in their journey. And there are a lot of things that they do that are great. And I try to appreciate what's great about those singers, but I know that that's not, I'm not that singer. Yes. I'm not that singer. If you're looking for, you know, a needlepoint perfection uh, version of every single thing. I'm not that singer. I, I try very hard to work on the needlepoint technique and all those things in the dressing room, in the studio. But then when I go on stage, I really try to service the emotion of the moment, no matter what that is. Ideally, I'm not up there singing like crap. Of course, nobody wants to go up there and sing like they forget how to sing. I don't want to do that either. But when if sometimes if you have to decide in the moment between making something beautifully and doing something exciting and surprising and unexpected in the moment, you know, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And that's fun. That's one of the joys of performing, getting to decide, you know. So, so actually, the reason I invited you to do this interview was your performance of Violetta in, in La Traviata. And actually, the, 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 scene, the scene of the de of her death and, mm -hmm. and this wonderful illusion of her being infused with life mm -hmm. and dying, mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm, so getting, I'm getting goosebumps while I'm talking, remembering <laughs> you, <laughs> remembering you doing that. Oh, thank you. But, but actually... That is one of my questions. Um, you are touching in all of your performances very overwhelming human emotions and experiences. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, it was death, there is jealousy, there is, and the ability to actually connect with death. And I could see that raw emotion coming from you. I mean, at the moment, I there were moments where I was not even hearing your, your singing as much as I, I <laughs> you know, see your emotion. And then it was constantly like, you know, shifting between those two. That's so great. Oh my God. I, I'm, I am actually very curious when you do perform these moments uh, and you connect, because I, I, I honestly cannot imagine you not connecting to this thing, <laughs> to this, to this emotions. Where is that place in you? Because they are quite overwhelming. And so what keeps your ground to, to be able to express them and then go back and kind of live your life or just have normal everyday duties? <laughs> well, I, I do want to say one thing, Alexandra. A lot of that is you, not me. Mm. And I know that because... Some audience members perceive the beauty that is inside them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, I, 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 I've, I've thought I've had this kind of little philosophy about it. You know, there are people who n don't like anything, and they say, "Oh, it's because my ear is very refined," or, or blah blah, and then, or, or I have different tastes. Um, but then there are people who love everything. They just love everything. And that's more them than everything. Everything isn't terrible, but everything isn't great. Yeah. Absolutely. If you look objectively. So it's really the person's reaction. So the fact that you're saying, well, I, you know, I felt this, this was happening and this was happening. That's your experience of the performance. Yeah. There's your, your heart projecting something back. And, and this is what's beautiful about a live audience. And I mean, sometimes I think to myself when I'm seeing something beautiful, like a mountain, Mm -hmm. or a sunset or something. And I think, wow, to me, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But if I'm ever unhappy or sad or hurting or oh, whatever, yes. I don't see it. I don't see the beauty. No, not at all. I don't know. Do you know, it's like, but the beauty's yeah. there, but yes. I'm not seeing it. So the fact that you have this experience during a performance says more about you than it does about me. I'm going to just say that first. The second thing I will say is that because I know that everyone reacts differently, I don't try to get a certain reaction out of people. If that makes sense. Like okay. I, it's kind of like saying when you play for laughs, you know, mm -hmm. versus playing for this or playing for that, you know, cause as an actor, you can play any direction you want. Generally the director will tell you, oh, I want you to play this way, you know, anger or this emotion. And you just play that even though in your heart, you might know, I don't agree with that. Or the audience wouldn't agree with that because I don't, I, this doesn't relate to something else they've been watching. And so as a performer, you have to try to kind of juggle 
mm-hmm. where you're supposed to be going with where you want to be going with what's really happening with blah, blah. And so all these different things, all these different factors play in. Now, Violetta, when she's by herself during the last act and she's reading the letter and she's remembering Alfredo and she's going through her, you know, her past and how, you know, she'll, she'll die alone. Um, and she's quite depressed, quite quite depressed uh it's it's that's the lowest that she feels it's like the lowest point in her in her life is right before her death and then he comes and it's all better for a minute and then she realizes she's not saved her disease didn't magically disappear and she has this horrible smack in the wall of reality because her fantasy was keeping her alive and now the fantasy is there and she's not She's still going to die. That is the worst realization because it's the it's the giant, um, the pessimism happening. Yeah. The thing that she knew would happen, which was that she would die, uh, even though she tried to hope that maybe, maybe, maybe God will save me. The fact that it doesn't happen makes her very upset. <laughs> she yeah. starts screaming and hollering and has this whole like you know thing and. I think it's a blessing that before she dies, she has a moment of feeling like she's she's alive again. Like there's a miracle. There's a miracle. I feel fine. I don't feel any pain. Mm-hmm. It's like the one grace that she gets before death. Mm-hmm. And isn't that interesting? That's like the last thing she feels. Yes. Yeah. Instead of like, oh no, I me, que dolore. It's not that. It's oh, que joya, oh joya. Um, and. I feel like that the irony of that moment, that's what breaks our heart like a hundred times over because we want her to live. We want them to be together. We want them to be okay. And we don't get that. And that's again, us running into the harsh reality of life of the, the inevitable, you know, of whatever sad thing may be happening, but, you know, and if I connect to that reality, I've never experienced anything as harsh as what Violetta has gone through, of course. But if I connect to that, the moments in my life, in all of our lives when we felt like I wanted something so, 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 so much. And I didn't get it. And it broke me. So it was so hard, whatever it was that you wanted, a love, you know, a job, a a compliment from someone, a friendship that you wanted so desperately to have it to keep. And it wasn't, didn't come for you. Um, and there's nothing you can do. You're helpless. You're completely powerless. Um, because everybody connects to that, Alexandra, I do try to then be in that headspace. Yeah. But there is an interesting thing. Although you do, you say it's about me, there is one thing that you are willing to connect to that place and oh. you're not afraid of connecting to being powerless. And to, and to, uh, so that's something I think I appreciate <laughs> about, about how you perform is is the fearlessness, the fearlessness of connecting to things that can be potentially shattering, shattering to connect to a place of I'm hopeless or I am alive now and then I'm not. And and the whole complexity of the moment of death, which I think sometimes we simplify and yet Mm -hmm. in your performance, it's not simple. Mm -hmm. It's everything, it's joy, Mm -hmm. is is, uh, depression, is sadness, is, like a, a flamboyant mix of everything mm-hmm. so that's something I think I, I I appreciated about your performance because as you say the flat singers they will be what Freddie Mercury would say they give us a touch of heaven which is perfection but that's not life mm-hmm. and I felt like what you gave at least me on that performance and I think probably many others is is a touch of life actually (laughs) oh thank you that means a lot to me Um, it really does i i'm very grateful that you feel that way and and if you know being fearless on stage is not something that i that i do naturally there's still a lot of things that i'm very afraid to do on stage i'm very afraid to go all the way and experience on stage there are performers that i've learned from that i still learn from you know um that like to say you know natalie to say i was uh, a huge admirer of her craft and everything that she did. And I always felt like she was totally fearless. Like there was no barriers between her and me when I was watching her in the audience. And I always, and I wanted so much to be that way. Mm. Um, even though 
I mean, she doesn't sing anymore, but every performance she did to me left, did that I saw left such an incredible impression. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't, but you know, you don't want to imitate that kind of thing in the sense of, oh, I do what Desse does, which is I do this movement or that movement, that gesture. Those are the gestures that come for her. You know, that again, that's something yoga taught me. Like what, how do I interpret this move in my body? Yes. Where does that come from? My center, you know, but maybe, um, but I follow the lead of seeing her where her gestures originate mentally or emotionally. Maybe there's a thought that in, that motivates a gesture. And that's actually something we have to do as actors that I've had so many great directors teach me about. And I'm still learning every time I do something, you know, they always, you never just originate a gesture just to do a gesture or just because the director said, now you push her or now you open the door. You have to have something that tells you before you do that to do it. And that kind of process when you're performing, when you're putting on an opera in particular, because an opera has a whole story. It's a theatrical piece. Mm -hmm. That is so fun to find all those little times where the light bulb goes off and you do something that, you know, we do every day in life as human beings, but it's so, when we get on stage, we turn into like these like wooden blocks. Like, I don't know what to do. Why am I doing, you know, and the director's trying to tell you just walk from one side of the room to the other and put this down. And it's like the hardest thing to do because <laughs> you're judging everything you're doing. And is, does this look cool? Do I look stupid? Am I like facing the wrong way? Like, cause you're always judging yourself. You're always mirroring in, in your mind. You're going, God, I hope this looks right. I hope this looks, you know, and, and then, but the audience can see that when you're like not sure. Oh my God, the audience can feel it. Like, like you have a sign over me that says, I have no idea what I'm doing, you know? Um, But if you learn how to mask that and learn how to work through that and use it to help you find good things, you know, that's, that's actor work. All that doesn't have anything to do with singing. (laughs) Yeah. Singing just adds another like level of difficulty to all of that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And I am curious about, um, the difference between performing for huge audiences in big mm. uh, in big spaces and yeah. and with very intimate small audiences and mm-hmm. i have interviewed some singers uh, and they they told me that there is a difference and then sometimes it does not have to be but i'm wondering how is it how is it for you and and what do each odd, different kind of presentations bring out in yourself well i definitely think that there are some differences, um, just like there are differences when you know there's a camera, mm. um, because, and I think singers get very self-conscious. I know I certainly do. I mean, it's not easy to look good while singing, uh, but you can't perform for the camera when there's an audience there. You have to perform for the audience. Now, one thing I learned very early on when I was a young artist was this idea that when you're on a big stage, you never want to make yourself smaller. Mm. And this is something that actually women do. Women make themselves smaller all the time. We're always diminishing. When we're sitting, we're crossing our legs. We're becoming thinner. Whereas men spread, men spread out. And I, I've never played. I've never played a pants role. Actually, no. I played one pants role in my life, and it was um, the little Cupid in Orfeo e Euridice. And but whenever I see mezzo sopranos, great mezzos who play pants roles do the spread, they open themselves. And this is great for playing a man, very believable, but women need to do it too. (laughs) Like on stage, like for example, you never want to give less than three quarters of your face to the audience if you can avoid it. Even though some directors like you to turn in profile and talk to a singer this way, but the audience loses half of your face and half of your voice. So you get to learn, this is things you learn through just operatic craft that now in a small house, you can get away with much more of diminishing yourself. The subtle things they read in a smaller house much more than they read in a huge opera house like the Met or any any large stage. So you'll never, almost never see a Met opera singer turn away from the audience or turn in profile from the audience. And if they're doing that nine times out of 10, it's because they're not experienced or because the director really, really pushed them to do that. And they'll do it in very few specific moments where it's a strong choice, but almost always your gestures, everything needs to be larger. However, another thing that I think is really um, useful to know large house or small house is that movement takes the eye. 
So, and a lot of singers feel uncomfortable being still. I know I feel uncomfortable being still, but stillness also when you're alone on stage can be really, really powerful and you want to trust it because if you start moving immediately, all we're seeing is the movement. So it's like, use movement carefully is what I mean. Like use it thoughtfully. It's like an accessory wall, right? It's the accessory wall. Use it thoughtfully. Otherwise, all you're doing is accessorizing. We don't see the core, which is you, which we don't want you to minimize. It's like another way of minimizing yourself is moving too much. So, I, you know, and these are all things that I've just learned from stage that I've been taught, that I've found through experiences that have helped me, you know, that I try to remember when I can. And how comfortable were you taking space? Uh, at first, you know, it's funny. The first time I ever played a character who was not a servant, <laughs> it was funny. I, um, the first time I ever played a queen, there was something that happened during rehearsal, like something fell to the floor and I went to go pick it up and the director, I was in rehearsal. He stopped me. He said, what are you doing? I'm picking up this thing that fell off the floor. He said, never, you would never pick up something. You have a servant to do that for you. You're, and because I was always playing Susanna, I had played the maid, you know, I played Gilda, I had played characters that would do something like that, would pick up something off the floor, but a queen never picks up something. There's another thing he was telling me, when you move through the crowd, they move for you. You don't make room for them. You move straight and they scatter, they spread apart like the, like the Red Sea. They move up to the side and you go down the middle. And I, I had such a hard time with that, Alexandra, because I was like, no, I... My natural instinct is, let me, you know, let me turn sideways so we can both fit or let me wait for you to pass or, mm -mm. and so I had to learn to do that. It's hard for me. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me because I want to adjust, you know, I'm, I try to be more flexible and I want to diminish myself. That's, you know, my instinct. I've had to learn to work to like, to, um, do you ever study Alexander technique before? I haven't, no. One of the fundamental things of Alexander technique when you're getting ready to do anything is your natural, the natural way you do it is, um, might throw you out of alignment. So you want to tell yourself, okay, I want to get up out of this chair, but I don't want to do it by lifting my chin and getting up like that. So you literally tell yourself, no, I'm not doing it that way. I'm going to do it this way. And you direct yourself to do it another way. So it's kind of the same idea of like, when I'm on stage, I go, Lisette. Don't hide yourself or don't, you know, uh, diminish yourself. And that's like, remember to do that. Sometimes I, I don't remember, but when I try to remind myself it, I find it um, helpful, but it's, it makes you feel vulnerable. That's the thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah. So I'm curious there um, uh, about what, do you feel that, the fact that you were naturally hiding yourself uh, mm -hmm. at some stage of your career uh, was stopping you for actually getting into the role that truly belonged to your voice and to the capacity you have. Yes. Yes. Tremendously. When you look at the singers who are the most successful showmen, mm -hmm. who whether or not you like their voice or not, they're excellent performers. They are people who never, never diminish themselves, never hide themselves. And they have this kind of charisma all the time um, that is at ease. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that not everybody feels comfortable being. I mean, it's, some people love to sing, mm -hmm. really do, but don't feel comfortable with the showmanship aspect. Yeah. of our career. And that doesn't mean you don't have to be a big, a big, you know, hot air balloon on stage. Of course not. You certainly don't have to be that. But I think you, it, if you are making yourself into a blade of grass, that's just there and you're singing a starring role, maybe the audience won't have the reaction to your voice that they would have if you gave them more to look at. Yeah. Or if you, if you were able to somehow, not have a block, a barrier of self-doubt mm -hmm. kind of overshadowing your performance because it does overshadow your performance. It might even get in your head about your singing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's kind of 
it's a bit of a, of a, this is why directors, opera directors are such great. They're great psychologists. They're wonderful. Yeah. The good ones, they're good at f- figuring out what it is that you don't feel comfortable doing and finding a way to either adjust that for you without pushing you into forcing you to do something that, you know, you don't, or finding a way to make you feel like it's okay. Mm-hmm. We're, we're all here together with you. Like maybe you, you need to take off your clothes on stage. You have to get in your underwear. I've had to do that. Oh my God. It's really distressing. Talk about not being comfortable, <laughs> wanting to diminish everything about myself. And the director said, no, she's a fantasy. You are a fantasy. Be that fantasy in this moment. I was like, but I'm not a fantasy, like, but you are. And it was like, he had to kind of, he was very generous about it and everything. And I, and I felt like, ah, you know, but it really, all directors have to, have to do that with their performers. I think mm-hmm. sometimes, you know? And I'm curious, this question is sitting with me for, for a while because we talked about difficult to accept reality. Uh, what mm. was one truth about reality that you found really difficult to accept and face? You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. You know, it's, uh, it's the moment I learned, you're talking about the career or, or just my life in general? It's kind of the same. Uh, let's do, Yeah concept both the concept in the career that I learned that was very hard was that you can't not not all the best singers have the best careers not it doesn't a a great voice does not immediately result in no matter how hard you work it does not result in a great career a great career is the result of some things that include generally great singing ideally but that's not the only ingredient it's like you can't just have flour and make a cake you have to have other things but you need flour so that was a little hard for me because I always thought growing up the cream eventually rises to the top yeah and it does I really do believe that but I don't think the cream is just the singing yeah at least not anymore some people hate that concept unfortunately I agree in a lot of ways it's frustrating that it's not that way because there are some people who are so very gifted who never get the opportunities and it drives me crazy. Um, But, and there are people who have to wait and wait and wait and wait to have a chance. And then by the time they get the chance, they've missed five years of what would have been a great time for them. So uh, that was very hard for me. And then the personal reality is very similar. It's the, it's the idea that I can't control everything. Mm -hmm. I feel embarrassed to say that. I feel kind of ashamed of myself that that's something that disappointed me because it's, it sounds so, um, I don't know. I sound like a jerk. I feel like I sound like a jerk, but when I realized, you know, I don't have control over, over every outcome. I can't control every, I have to learn to relinquish control over things. And I, it, it's frustrating. I want things to go a certain way. I want to do things to contribute to the outcome that I want. Yeah. When the outcome doesn't come, it frustrates me because I think I did this, 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 this. I should have that. Like it's math. It's not math. Life is not math. If life were math, we would all be in a very different situation. Life's not math. And, and that's a, a harsh reality that, that I'm ashamed to admit that aggravates me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, I have gone through the same. The last two years have been very humbling. And I also, being a scientist um, and knowing Mm -hmm. that, you know, as a scientist, you feel like, oh, I I do have a lot of control because I understand so much about the world, but actually, (laughs) not really. And actually what helped me is there is a book which is called The Unknown Unknowns. So mm-hmm. the things that we know, we know, the things that we don't, don't know, so we know that we don't know, which are easy, so we Google them, but, <laughs> but there are these unknown unknowns, which they will pose in front of us, and those are the ones we need to kind of um, make space for and let our intuition guide us to. And, and actually, in this small essay, the, the, the writer says that it is the spice of life. Because if we could control everything and could control the outcomes, it will be very limited, the universe. That's true. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I definitely empathize because I have been in that exact place and was humbled by life. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. 
So uh, I uh, I want to talk here about the concept of success. We touched uh, briefly about about this, but I'm mm. wondering what does the concept of success look for you now and how did it change over time? Because you are quite outwardly successful, but I'm pretty sure you felt yourself worthy of success much earlier. <laughs> oh, um, thank you for saying that. I, I believe everyone's worthy of success. I really do. And I want, but I also, you know, success, it depends on how you define it. And I've, I've struggled with that definition in my life several times, Alexandra, because I used to think that success was having a steady, at least career wise, was having a steady career singing and making enough money to get by on only singing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's the definition of success. Um, But does that necessarily make you happy? For some people, sure. For some people, no. There needs to be something else. So then, okay. So then it's having every job, you know, being able to sing success, being able to sing and make enough, make ends meet and having a great love life. Is that enough for some people? Yes. For some people, no, I also want blah. So it's like, what was that always for me? I always knew deep down that I would be a singer or a musician. So I'm, if I can say, I check that off on my list. I sing for a living. Yes success. I'm doing what I knew I was meant to do. That makes me very happy. I'm not flipping burgers. I'm not waiting tables. I am very happy and lucky that I can do this as my job. And I have a wonderful husband. I have the most incredible, beautiful relationship, wonderful marriage for which I'm more than grateful. And for that, if I lost everything else, but still only had that, I would still be happy because that's really, for me, love is everything always was. Career is fine, but love was always the most important thing to me. So I have those two things together, which is like next nirvana, next level happiness, like everything I could possibly want. Um, But I think what I would like to have more of, if you will, um, is a little bit more inner peace. Mm. Um, and I strive to find that. And I find it sometimes I find little like pockets of like, oh, there, what, there it is for a minute. I had that. Um, and I struggle because I think I struggle with anxiety. I know I struggle with anxiety. I have to accept that. I struggle with anxiety because I don't know what the outcome of things will be. And it stems from that need to control everything or try to do everything in my power to make the outcome I want happen. But then also knowing that there are things out of my control that will contribute and can contribute to a disaster. Um, And I would like to be the kind of person, I would like to get to a point where I can be at peace with any outcome. Um, So what is success for me? I think I have it. I'm happy, I'm alive, I'm healthy. I sing for a living. I have a wonderful husband. I have a beautiful family that loves me and that I love. You know, I get to tour the world. When I count my blessings, Alexandra, it's like I lose, they number the stars, if you will, you know, and I can't, uh, I can't say that there's anything missing from my life. What I would like to be able to do is manage my feeling that if things don't go well, it'll still be okay. That's hard for me. You know, do you ever feel like the world is going to end if this one performance doesn't go exactly. well? Like, oh my God, like <laughs> what the hell? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes, I I, I must admit exactly this morning. <laughs> really? I, I was, I was having a session with my therapist and I have touched that place, which is the place of I'm at the seaside. Everything is good. And yet there is an overwhelming sense of loneliness and of fear that mm-hmm. things will not end up well. And as, as you, or to some extent, not, not maybe as much as you, but I do have all the things that I could check off of my lists. And yet I touch this point and, and I actually was reading some of your posts and I, I, I realized, yeah, this is like, you know, you wrote that you were in Grand Canyon or somewhere and saying, oh, I wish I could bring a little bit of that peace or that mo- moment with me. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, yes, that that's something. Some sometimes I feel like if I can bottle up these moments and just have them and have the have the safety inside myself to to know yes. whatever comes, I'll weather it. But it's not it's not an easy thing to weather. Um, mm. And and I think it comes again coming from a, from a country uh, where there is there was a lot of trauma. Um, I now understand where these things coming from, and and that feeling that of transgenerational feeling of unsafety, yes, and of not being seen, and yeah. So I do I do understand uh, definitely can relate to that. <laughs> oh, bless you. Well, yeah, and I think these past couple of years and all the you know the news yes. that we read all the time it really contributes to anxiety to feelings yeah, of helplessness and loneliness and and feeling isolated all that i think got really worse for me during the pandemic uh and even now because i always feel like you shouldn't be happy there are people dying there are pe- you know what i'm saying that came very that message came across very strong yeah um to the point that sometimes i felt like gee i can't i really shouldn't post about my successes ever, because there's always going to be some horrible disaster going on in the world. And that's more important. That should take more precedent in my emotional, well, my emotional, what I'm contributing to the world should be about that and not about singing opera. Who cares about singing opera? You know what I'm saying? Like, so I, I got a lot of that feeling during the pandemic and I, once in a while, uh, I, I, don't post about successes because I mean, posting is who cares what social media, but social media is kind of how we communicate now with our public. And, and, um, no, I don't, um, always post about every success because sometimes it's not appropriate. It's insensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time you're not trying to be insensitive, but you are, if you're only ever posting about, um, the tragedies and you're only ever living in the, in the news cycle of difficulty with the shootings that are going on with racism that is ever present in our society with unfair, you know, with the economy going the way it's going and, and, and COVID still very much a part of our, of our fabric of society. If you're, if that's the world that we're in, that we're stuck in, and it is, unfortunately, then, um, if you have anxiety <laughs> and if you, if you really do think, Oh God, things aren't going to be okay. It's very easy for, for you to be right. <laughs> yeah. Things aren't okay. Things aren't okay. You know, and, and that's really rough to weather because e- even if they're not okay, Alexandra, when you go to work, you have to do your job. Exactly. Yeah. Don't you? Somebody is waiting for you. You have a responsibility. Yeah. If you have children, you need to be there for your children. You can't be locked in your room crying and neglecting them even though you might need to be sometimes, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I, you have to balance your responsibilities with your social, where are you, where are you in the social yeah. cycle, I guess, you know, that's rough. Yeah. I mean, like what helps <laughs> me is actually understanding the fact that I think what is a general conversation is this either, or either I'm or tragically desperate or very happy. And I guess like coming back to Violetta and her, last dying scene Mm -hmm. in that moment she's everything we all are and that's why we relate exactly so so i for me what it really helps is to remind that i can be very sad for what's happening in ukraine and very happy that i'm finally getting a uk citizenship you know (laughs) that's amazing so so those are those are those are things that yeah i i i I agree but it is it is easy to slip into thinking that i need to be either very happy or or extremely or extremely sad yes you're right um so coming back to um uh your husband uh that's one thing i really wanted to touch upon because it's just beautiful to see the way he cares about you and the 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 way he just the genuine uh connection you two have is is beautiful and i'm curious because there was a story behind that as well uh i'm curious how did you allow that support to come into your life as someone who is actually very (laughs) self-sufficient I'm not so sufficient at all. I need Steven from the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I go to sleep, girlfriend. I, I, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's so, um, he's really my other half. And, and I feel, um, grateful that, that we found each other when we did in high school, you know, it was when we met and then we were apart for many, many years. And then we reconnected on Facebook 
back when Facebook was still innocent, when Facebook was was its its naive self, um, and we connected that way, and then we kind of started um, to reassemble our lives so that we could be together. Because I always loved him. He was my first love. I never forgot him. He kept all my letters. He never forgot me. So we had this incredibly deep, young, old connection. Uh, he was my first little boyfriend, you know, but I didn't kiss him. We didn't, I mean, it was so innocent, puppy love, but I was always in love with him because I always thought he was so special. Like he stood out to me. Mm. He was like this, another being like everybody else was just, I want to steal a, to steal a word from a friend of mine that I was talking to about, about love. She said, everybody else compared to her boyfriend, everybody else is beige. Yeah. Yeah compared to him. And I'm like, that's exactly how I feel about Stephen. Like everyone else is beige. And Stephen is like this beautiful, like bright luminosity. And, and, um, and he, uh, he and I had to rearrange our lives so that we could be together because when we, were, when we were getting together as adults and we weren't teenagers anymore, right. You know, we were both, he had to uproot his life. You know, I had to, I was moving out of uh, Brooklyn into Manhattan. I was leaving the young artist program. I was beginning an international journey and it was like we had to like sit down and have a bunch of hard conversations about okay how what are you know what are we doing you get caught up in the love but you really do have to figure out what you're doing what you want and we both want the same thing which is where I think love you have to both want the same thing mm-hmm. ideally you can love each other but a relationship works when you're both on the same page it's at least that's how it's worked best for me and Steven yeah. we're both on the same page about what we want what we want to contribute what we're committing to um, you know, he's accepting, he had to accept my career and this is what I wanted to do. And he had to accept what his role in it could be, if any, and make a role in it. Maybe at first he wasn't sure what his role would be in my life. You know, was he just going to follow me around or are we going to be separate six months out of the year? Or do we want kids? Like what all those things had to like be discussed, you know, and we both agree on all those big things. And now we have a wonderful, um, you know, loving fulfilled relationship we never fight we never you know we we and it's interesting also alexandra that he and i are so very different there's so little in common truly i mean we we agree on the big things but we're both very different approaches about life about who we are our emotional nature you know and how we express ourselves and the kinds of things the interests that we have. And that keeps things cool because we're always talking, he's teaching me something new and I'm teaching him something new and we're learning from each other. And we're not just like regurgitating the same subject matter. And we're not both in love with the same subject matter. If he was another singer, all we would do is talk about singing. So, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I I don't want to judge other singers who's who date singers. I not at all. Maybe not. Well, you know, and we also cultivated many interests together. So like running, this is something we both were terrible at. Yeah. And both started to do together as a couple and we run as a couple. And that's something that helped us bond, helped us grow. So it's not just that we love each other, but it's the activities that we do together as a couple that I felt like have made us very strong and very happy that we're not just, he goes to work, I go to work, we come home, we eat and we go to sleep. It's more than so much more than that. And our communication is very, very high, very, um, just ever present. I can't, that's why I said, if I don't feel like I could ever be self-sufficient now, I I certainly, I can't even walk down the street. (laughs) I'm useless, you know? So, so Stevie, he's really, I just love him so much. I'm curious there, uh, what I always search for. And I'm, I'm wondering because you are an ever evolving person and I don't, again, don't see you stopping doing that. Uh, (laughs) How do you evolve together and how do you make space for the new use that appear or like things that just appear and you just can't predict that they will come? Mm -hmm. Well, we, uh, we agree on um, being ever evolving people. Actually, he loves change. Mm. Stephen loves change. He loves trying new things more than I do even, you know, like he'll be the first person. If there's a new drink, new flavor, he's drinking a new flavor. Okay. I want to try the new flavor, but you might not like it. Like I I, I would be the one to say, no, I want the old flavor that I know I like, you know? (laughs) And uh, so he has this, this, this everlasting curiosity um, that, and a wonderful enthusiasm also. So not only is he always curious about trying new things and he's never like, 
afraid to try something new, which is great in our job because we're always in a new place speaking another language. He's also very enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. He's not like, okay, I'll go. Okay, let's do this again. No, on the contrary, he's always looking for um, something to do, something fun, something. um, And I think it's because he's a, he, likes change he's he enjoys not just change but more about going somewhere a journey a constant um evolution but an, a sense of andare a sense of go not mm-hmm. he's not a sit down sit back guy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. never and i i i wish more people could be like that you know i learned from him because i so easily it's so easy for me to get caught up in a cycle yeah. An emotional cycle or uh, whatever, not even not a particularly healthy one sometimes. And Stephen will be the first person to get out of that. Cause he's, it's like, he just innately knows that that's not a healthy place to be in. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So, but he's also very accepting and compassionate towards me when I need something. Like if I need to sleep more because I'm really tired, he's not going to wake me up and force me out of bed. He lets me sleep. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like he, he's, He's there for me in a way that, uh, I mean, if everybody that I talked to, everybody that knows Steven is like, we want to clone him, <laughs> <laughs> but he's really, he's just a great man. And, and I'm, I'm lucky and I've become a better person because of him. Mm. So, yeah. That's very beautiful. So I'm being mindful of the time. So I'll just ask one short question before sure. we wrap up. Okay. So it's about teaching and oh. uh, what do you feel like you uh, are doing for young performers and do you like the word teaching or is it something else that you think you're doing well i mean um i do you know teach in in the sense that when when there's a young singer that comes to me and we have a, a coaching together i i do try to give them advice or tips uh on on things or not even so much teaching teaching isn't always showing someone how to do something sometimes it's showing someone how to the questions to ask to get to the answer that's right for them, if that makes sense. Because I might say, look, for me, I do this, but I've also tried this, this, this. It didn't really work for me, but maybe it'll work for you. Why don't you try that? Um, So it's kind of like I give them a space to try something out and give them the feedback and say, hey, that sounded really great in your voice. You should do that vowel because for me, that was really excellent. You know what I mean? So it's like I give feedback, but I also answer questions. I mean, if, uh, if somebody has a question about a role or a pronunciation and they just need to know the answer, you know, then yeah, I'll try to let them know as best I can. But again, I, I think that, um, I learn when I teach more than anything. Like I, I, it's almost, uh, self-serving <laughs> to teach yeah. other singers because you go, Oh, wow. That's really, I never thought to try this that way. The way that singer who's totally, um, naive, Mm -hmm. doesn't have all the hangups that I do that naive free person is doing this and this and it's great I want to try to find that in myself if possible you know um so I like I like to and I like to just be there for them I like to encourage them Mm -hmm. it's not I don't like and I always try to tell them don't try to be like me necessarily being like me is not what you want you want to be the best you that you can be yeah voila and and that's where I try to give them the space to play experiment and feel safe because they always get shot down when they try stuff, you know, um, often anyway, they get criticism left and right. And I don't need to be another one of those voices telling them they're not good enough. And this is bad. And this is sucks and blah, blah. And all the best teachers I ever had never told me those types of things. They always made me feel good about trying something else, you know, and I, I try to give that to them as much as I can. Mm, this is really beautiful so i will just ask two rapid fire questions one is what sure. kind of compliments you like to receive oh mine are so superficial fine <laughs> i i i uh it's terrible i'm ashamed of myself but the truth the truth i love getting compliments on my appearance mm. because i don't get them that often and so when i do get them i really really appreciate them um and I also feel like I love to get compliments um, on things that I've worked very hard to try and do. So when someone notices it and they say, oh, great job, that makes me feel good. 
if things that happen by accident that I, you know, that are just natural, I, those compliments, they're nice, but they don't hit me as deeply as the ones that I go, thank you so much. Cause I really, really was trying to do that tonight, or I really wanted to make that, get that across. And mm -hmm. if you felt it and you liked it, then thank you. <laughs> yes. You know, um, <laughs> Yeah. Cool. And uh, the other thing is, what is an absurd thing about you that not many people would know about? Oh, I can't tell you that either. <laughs> <laughs> absurd. I, I have an old habit left over from when I was like, it must have been a baby as long as I can remember that I, I love taking a blanket and squeezing it in my hands, a blanket or a pillow. I must have done it when I was a baby, like needing, you know, like I must have done this when I was a baby because I can't ever remember not doing it. And I even do it on stage during Lucia without me, like I, we were always rehearsing and there was a scene, there's a scene, there's a bed and I'm always, I have to sit down on the bed and I always have to put the blanket over me. And I always feel myself like needing the blanket. <laughs> Like people are going to think I'm so insane. I was doing it during rehearsal. I would just sit there and she's, the director's talking and I'm just sitting there with the blanket, like petting it, like, a, like an insane. And she must think, what is wrong with her? Like, who does that? I don't know. So it's like an old habit. Yeah. Yes. It's very absurd. I'm embarrassed. No, no, but no. It's no. true. It's self-soothing. It's self-soothing. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. It does feel very good. It feels comforting. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i i would i would love to know more but in the <laughs> limitation of time uh we will stop here and i really want to thank you i really want to thank you for being open vulnerable raw just being you and being brave enough to be you so thank you thanks thank you alexandra thank you for this deep dive and this really sweet um discussion i i i feel like i learned a lot about you also because like i said i feel like there's so many things that are in the eye of the beholder the eye of the, the ear of the listener um, that say more about you and the kind of person that you are because you're always curious about other people. It just, what a wonderful person you are. And, and I just want to say thank you for letting me talk to you today. You have just heard the story of Lisette Oropesa, one of the most in-demand lyric coloraturas today who performs leading roles at the most important opera houses around the world. She has appeared in concert hall and opera stages all over the world since graduating from the New York Young Artists Program in 2008 and has become one of the most celebrated singers of her generation, both for her singing and her inspiring personal story. Lisette is a devoted runner and has completed six marathons as an advocate for health and fitness. If you want to connect with her and find out more about her story, you can visit www.lizetteropesa.com. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope you will like and subscribe so our stories can reach more people.